filmmaker on the Windrush, on the Empire Windrush. And he's got some very interesting um, records. So if it's okay to, to do that, because Levi's like me here in Australia in late in the evening. Um, so that, that will work out okay. So I think we'll start our recording then. And Simon, that's great. Thank you very much again for Belong Nottingham for hosting this meeting. And thank you as well um, for David Alston, Highlands and Scotland, who was part of the uh, team that got all this going. And myself and my colleague, Caroline Sanson from Learning Links International. And we're initiating this. And it's good to see uh, Chris Campbell here from the South Wales Jamaica Society. Caroline and I are also members of the North Wales Jamaica Society. So those of you in North Wales who want to know what that's all about, we'll, we'll let you know at some stage. But Levi, so can we have a conversation then? Yes, indeed. Yeah, okay. Are you, are you going to put your camera on or are you going to be... Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, hang on. I'm just trying to get that organised, actually. All right. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, it's really such a coincidence that we're talking with Levi here because um, I met Levi um, when we were, I was living in uh, Melbourne City with my, my daughter and, um, and uh, Levi had some responsibilities to to deliver things and and um, made sure that we we got what we wanted and uh, I recognized his interesting accent because it sounded as if he came from Birmingham like me yeah. so uh, so I said uh, oh no, where'd you come from then and he said oh from the UK I said uh, and where in the UK Levi I said uh, putting on my Birmingham Wolverhampton accent and he said oh I come from Birmingham my mum lives in Birmingham and I said oh that's interesting and talking about one or two things and then somehow Levi and I don't know how this happened we got around to this conversation about the sort of things I was interested in and um, oh, yeah. we talked you about your you. dad and your dad um, uh, travelled over to the UK on the Empire Windrush yeah that's um, right and what's really uh, special about this is that it appears that your dad was called Neil. Was your dad Neil? No, my father was. His name was Daniel. Sorry. Um, Neil is my uh, younger brother. Right. Um, so I was just going to say a little bit about the um, my father's interview. Um, yes, please do, because that that was so fascinating that Levi said his father yeah. had been interviewed by the BBC. And we yeah. don't know whether this has ever been um, broadcast, but we're, we're, we're looking at ways to be able to, to share it. And also your brother, Neil, lives yeah. in um, near Newtown in, in, right, um, in Wales. mid Wales. Yeah. So have you been in touch with him? Uh, yes, I have. Yes. So um, he's isolating at the moment, like everybody else, I guess. So, <laughs> um, <Okay>, well. <laughs> but, um, but just Maybe look, so. My father was interviewed by the BBC, um, I think it was sometime in the late um, 90s, and um, the interview was recorded. And um, when my father came out to visit me in Australia, uh, which was his only visit, and that was in 2000, um, he actually gave me um, a copy of the, the interview. And um, I didn't actually listen to it at the time while he was here for some reason. It was actually after he left, I'd actually listened to it. And I guess I, I sort of realised the importance of the of the interview. So um, when I left the UK, which was back in 1989, um, I don't recall knowing much about the the Windrush at all, and uh, I certainly don't recall any reference to the uh, Windrush uh, generation, which I guess subsequently uh, developed um, after my departure in '89. But anyway. Um, when I uh, first heard the, the interview, uh, which, as I said, was sometime after my father's visit to uh, Australia, um, I guess I thought I, re I realised that um, it was actually quite an interesting um, document because it um, was a lot of information there that I wasn't aware of, um, things that my father never discussed at home, just about the, um, the journey from Jamaica, um, his settlement in the UK and a whole range of issues that he sort of experienced at the time. Um, he also talked about his motivation for 
leaving the um, the, the the West Indies, and um, I, I suppose I, I my sort of impression was that most people left for economic reasons to better themselves um, in the UK, but um, certainly according to what my father had to say in the interview, um, he left. Um, I think it was basically to do with the fact that he was educated in the British system. And I guess like a lot of people living in the colonies, Britain was seen as the, the center of things. And he always aspired to travel to the UK. He um, seemed to have um, great appreciation of British culture and history. Uh, and that's something that he wanted to experience. So I think he saw himself as a young man who wanted to embark on this sort of journey, he saw himself as a bit of a pioneer and that he saw it as a bit of an adventure to travel to the UK. So, um, so he, he talks about, um, as I said, some other, some other uh, reasons as well. Um, as I said, it was just to sort of get away uh, from, the, from, from Jamaica, as I said, and to, do, to try something different, as I said, and the UK was seen as a natural place. And it's interesting because um, a lot of Australians I've spoken to um, travel to the UK as well. So I think, it, I think it, it's, it's a similar trip experience to other people in the colonies who saw the UK, London as the place to sort of travel to. And I think that was, that was part of his um, motivation for traveling. Mm. Um, um, and so he was able to, I guess, come up with the funds for the passage. And I think his brother, according to my mother anyway, it was actually his brother who actually helped him with the, with the passage to, to pay for the fare. Mm -hmm. And um, so he was able to acquire a ticket and um, was there on the boat. So, so he also, in the interview also, um, I guess he talks about the journey across uh, from Jamaica. He talks about who was on the boat, um, predominantly males. He said there were very few women on the journey. Mm -hmm. um, he talked about where the boat stopped. So I think the first place they traveled to was Mexico. Um, then they went on to Cuba, which was all new to him. And then on to Bermuda. And then I believe it was from Bermuda. They sailed on to, um, to Tilbury. Um, so he also talks about his arrival there in Til Tilbury, what it was like, um, very cold. I, I guess that's a common experience with most traveling from the, the West Indies for the first time. They're struck by the cold weather. <laughs> that was a greeting in the UK. Um, and he said that particular, uh, well, I think it, well, he arrived in June, so it was actually summertime, but it was a particularly cold um, summer, probably a bit like the one we're experiencing now in Melbourne at the moment. Um, oh. So that was, um, that was the sort of greeting. So, um, I mean, he also talks about other things, about his, um, some of the attitudes that he encountered when he arrived um, in the UK. Um, I think that because he'd studied so much of British history and he saw himself as British, I think that um, he was expecting to sort of fit nicely into the UK, um, that it would be straightforward because, you know, we sp spoke English. He didn't um, speak much patter himself, although my mother tended to. Uh, ten, uh, she speaks with, with more of a heavy Jamaican patois, but my father um, spoke with a sort of a cultivated accent. So I think he was expecting to be received and quite easily in the UK, but that wasn't the case at all. So, um, so he, he doesn't talk. It's interesting that my father doesn't use the word um, racism. He tends to refer to prejudice that um, I guess um, he encountered a fair bit of prejudice and he was quite surprised by that because um, he thought that because he knew so much about the British history he thought that the people in England knew a lot about the West Indies as well and he was quite surprised at how little they knew about the, the West Indies and um, were quite ignorant too about um, black people so I think he was quite surprised um, by that. Um, I also, he also talked about um, meeting people who were quite sort of open and liberal. So he talks about meeting middle-class people. He thought that they were a lot more sort of open than some of the, the working class people he encountered at work, um, who he thought were quite, as I said, ignorant. 
Um, but he, he does give a number of anecdotes about one of the one of his anecdotes is um, he was out in the park somewhere and um, um, an Englishman came up to I think he was with a, with a couple of other friends. And this Englishman was quite curious, having not seen black people before. And they struck up a conversation and um, he was invited um, back to their place, back to this guy's place, which I think his mentions were somewhere in Smithy. And um, so my father and his friends um, took up the invitation and they were quite excited to, to go back and to spend some time uh, in the home of an English person. And um, on the way there, um, they, they got a bit lost and needed some direction. So my father um, approached the woman and um, said, you know, excuse me. And as soon as he opened, as soon as he spoke, she ran away. <laughs> so this is sort of late 1940s. And she, he said, and, you know, in the interview, he talks about just running and running and running and just running. You know? and, um, and, and he was just really surprised by that because um, he'd never sort of encountered that before. And as I said, he saw himself as being British. So he was quite surprised um, by that. Um, he also goes on to talk about um, some of the difficulties in acquiring housing as well. He said that was quite difficult. He said, although people were quite, uh, people would be quite friendly towards him, quite often when it came to offering work or housing, then that was another story. So um, that's where he encountered some difficulties. Um, and often the work that was available, he thought was, I guess my father thought it was a bit below, it was unskilled work. And I guess because um, um, he received more education back in Jamaica than, than most at that time, he thought that uh, um, he should be doing more skilled type of work. He was more capable of doing skilled work, but often that wasn't um, offered to him. And, um, and often when there were job vacancies, um, he was often, uh, he, he would ring up and would be told, put on his best uh, British accent and was told that yes, the job is available. And then he'd turn up and then suddenly he'd be told, you know, the job's no longer available. So, so um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's quite a, a sort of comprehensive account, uh, the interview. Um, I do have a transcript of the interview too, which I can make available, but I think it is, um, a useful sort of historical document because I said, you know, it, apart from his initial experiences, he talks about what life was like for him in the UK. He talks about, you know, my, his marriage to my mother. He talks about the children. The church played a very important role for my father as well. He talks about his aspirations. Um, he wanted to become a teacher um, and actually attended um, Hansworth Technical College. Oh. Um, <laughs> Yes, <laughs> actually talks about I that. Thought too. There. <laughs> yeah, he talks about the answer at Technical College. Um, and then he decided that because uh, Britain was very much um, a place of manufacturing and uh, an industry, that perhaps he should, he should become an engineer instead. So, so we decided to enroll in an engineering course. Um, but then he talks about, you know, all the children coming along. So there were seven of us all together. And so um, he wasn't really able to finish his studies. So, um, so you know, because the priority became the family, uh, I guess, at that time. Mm -hmm. So that didn't um, take off for him. So, um, but, I, but I think um, the church played a big role for my father because I think that, I think the, um, my father was like an elder at the church. And I think that gave him a bit of a leadership role, which I think he was, I think he felt he was more cut out with his education for more sort of leaderships. Um, and I think the church provided that opportunity for him. So, um, but yes, yeah, so, so yeah, so that, that's just a, a quick overview of the of the interview. But um, there, yeah, there, there, there were some um, things, as I said, that I wasn't really, like I wasn't, I wasn't, before listening to the interview, I, I wasn't aware of his reasons for traveling um, to the UK. I mean, I, I had some idea about some of the experiences he'd encountered, although, although in the interview, um, it, it did say that he um, didn't really want to talk to us. That's myself and, and my brothers and sisters about some of the difficulties he encountered because he didn't want to prejudice us against the, the English. He wanted us to settle into 
to England and become English. And so often a lot of the difficulties he experienced, he didn't really share that with us. But, you know, he does talk about that in the interview. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating, Levi. And yeah. one of the things that, that, yes, round of applause there. Thank, Thank you, you for summarising. Um, what, is, what is really a long interview um, yeah. uh, takes about, well, it's 45 minutes or more, isn't it? Yes, yeah, um, yeah, a bit more than that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, and it's not edited. Um, yeah. Whether it was actually broadcast by the BBC or not, I don't know. Do you know? I'm not sure because I was no. I was yeah. wasn't there in the UK at the no. time, so no. I'm not sure. No. Yeah, but yeah. Um, what fascinated me when I first heard it was that the interview took place around the 1980s, I think. I think it was uh, 90s. Yeah, sometime in the 90s. Yeah, 1990s. Yeah. So yeah. as yeah. as you say, some of the things that now we talk about racism, we talk about Windrush, the Windrush generation. Yeah. He's yeah. not talking in those terms at all. No, he doesn't know. No. In, in that way. No. And I think the way you just described that he didn't share yeah. with you because he wanted you to settle in. Yeah. Um, and, and some of the other comments he made, it's really interesting. So what we'll try and do is make, um, yeah. if it's okay with you, make the interview available for people to listen to through our yeah. website. Yeah, yeah, so we'll, that's right. We'll, we'll yeah. work on that and, and get that yeah. because it is quite fascinating. And yeah. we have several themes that are going on through our, our Black History Lunchtime conversation sessions. And yeah. Windrush, the story of the Windrush generation, um, is very much one of those stories. And yeah. we've had Yasser Safari with us before now doing some yeah. poetry. And the um, National Poet of Wales, Evo yeah. Apglin, um, presented his uh, poem on on um, his response to to Windrush, so that was yeah. was interesting too. So thank you. So questions from from anybody else or comments from others? Tony, have you got anything that you you want to add? I don't know. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, thanks for that experience, Le uh, Levi. That was. Um, I found that um, very, very informative. As as a um, someone who's very interested in history, yeah. um, I would have loved to have had that audio. Is it an audio? You said of the yeah, it's an audio. It's an audio interview. Yeah, yeah. I would have yeah. loved to have to have yeah. had that because last semester, one of the topics that we I was teaching on my course at the university yeah. here was um, actually. Um, the Windrush generation, the 1950s yeah. and 60s, black presence in Britain. Yeah. And um, whilst we have, you know, we have uh, some accounts of the people who actually came in the in the late 40s and 50s yeah. in particular. Yeah. What um, what we don't tend to have a lot is audio. Yeah. So um, yeah. I, I've just sat there listening, thinking, "Wow, I wish I'd had that audio to play to the oh, students." It's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a great, yeah, it's a great you, you, yeah, you yeah. can't beat that primary resource. No, no, you that, can't. That, that's, yeah. that's a rich primary yeah. source. Yeah, even for ten minutes. Each time I that, listen to it, I, I pick up something new. You know, yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of subtlety yeah. and nuance in it as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah thanks, and, then, Tony. Well, we'll make sure you've you've got that ready for you when you're teaching that again. <laughs> Yes, and, yeah, and yeah. also it, you I, may I, be able to advise us on links because we did make an effort to link with Race Council Cymru who were doing um, um, a heritage lottery research project on the Windrush generation in Wales and because um, Levi's brother lives in Wales we thought it might be appropriate but I don't think they, they took that up did they Levi so uh, no. maybe we'll look at the, um, the, the group in, in London. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's that's brilliant. Thank you. So, Chris, Thank you. you wanted to ask. Yeah, I leave. I, um, Hi, how are you? Fine, okay. thank you. Uh, oh, the Wolverhampton crew together here now. Another Wolverhampton. <laughs> I'm not Wolverhampton originally. I'm from Birmingham. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm a, I'm a Brummie. So, um, <laughs> sorry, we've got the um, building going on outside, but I was going yeah. to say, um, your father, your father's experience of aspiration and wanting yeah. more. I see that echoed in Birmingham of, um, you know, I was, I'm only first generation probably like yourself, but I see it yeah. amongst our relatives who had a good education. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
yeah so i can actually um resonate and yeah. um, you know and actually have a vision because you're talking about the birmingham area in that yeah. time yeah i was for your father um, yeah and um again i would like to see uh, or air the audio or read yeah. a transcript because i'm very interested mm. in that. thank you yeah for your speech. yeah thank you. thanks thanks chris that's great Okay, well, I think that, uh, that's fascinating. I was just going to ask, I wonder if your father, it's a difficult one, this, but your mother might know, because she's still around, isn't she? Yeah. Um, uh, we um, often speak of a, a guy called Enrico Stennett, who came over the year before, and Jim Sepadordin knows um, Enrico's story very well, um, and he was helping people who first came and who came on the Windrush. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if that's a name. Yeah. Um, so there's just yeah. a question about which church my father attended. Yeah. Oh yeah. So um, so I was just going to say. So I think I think when my father left Jamaica, he was a Baptist, and then I think sometime in the fifties he joined the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and um, in the interview he also talks about his experiences at the church because um, I think initially when he first joined the church it was a predominantly white. And um, he faced some prejudice there, in his own words, you would say, at the church. Mm -hmm. And it was a struggle to get the, um, the first black minister in the Adventist church. And it's interesting now because the whole of the Adventist church now, I think, in England is predominantly black, even the, uh, even the, uh, the conference president as well. But he, he's talking about back in the, the late 1950s and 60s in those days, um, what it was like at the church. So that sort of prejudice or discrimination he faced everywhere, even within the church. Um, although we also talked about having some, he said, I think he talks about the very first church he visited, which was a Baptist church, and that he received quite a warm, pleasant reception at that church. I'm um, not sure which one it was, but um, so, but it, my father often used the word, he uses the word mixed um, about his experiences. I guess we we're referencing some, some experiences were good and some, some okay. So, I think it's quite balanced in his judgment, probably a bit more than myself would be, I guess, yeah. Um, but um, yeah. <clears throat> right, well, thank you so much. And we'll yeah. we'll carry on with this, the, the, yeah. the theme, the Windrush theme and what we're looking yeah. at. We'll make yeah. sure that we, we're sharing the, the transcript. Uh, both. Yeah. Can we share the transcript and the audio? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that's wonderful. Yeah. And yeah. uh, and we'll take advice from um, from others like um, uh, uh, Tony um, about where where we may be able to, to share that best. Yeah. Um, so that's that's good. Um, okay. So um, thank you very very much indeed, um, Levi. And I look forward to talking with you some more again. Yes, it does indeed. make me feel yeah. at home. It's really good. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. So lovely. So thank you, uh, Caroline, for that question as well. That was really helpful. So if you want to ask any questions or make any comments or any time, or if you can't hear or whatever, just put it on the chat and we'll we'll get and sort it out. Okay then. So um, Levi, are you welcome to to hang on with us as long as you feel able to? But we understand yeah. if you need to to get on yeah. your way. I know you've got something on early tomorrow morning. Yeah. Okay, thanks ever so much. That's brilliant. So I'm now going to ask you, Tony Talbot, if uh, Dr. Tony Talbot, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Um, uh, I, I, when I, I wrote wrote out to people to tell them about the the session, I uh, I included uh, a clip from LinkedIn, which is quite useful for finding out what people are about. But uh, it'd be better if you can can introduce yourself, please. I'd be very very grateful. And then you can have as long as you like to tell us about your work because it's so interesting. And um, then we can uh, carry on with the conversation and ask questions. Thanks, Antony. Right. Um... Okay, well, first of all, thanks for in inviting me, Liz. It's been a long time since we've um, connected. I, I was trying to remember, it's, it's probably more than 10 years, if not longer. That could be, um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, strangely enough, I can relate to Chris um, in the sense that I was also born in a place called West Bromwich, um, England. So, um, 
So um, I'm not too far from another place, from Google Ramsden and Birmingham, etc. And I live in Birmingham. Um, my background is that I was like born in Jamaica, Jamaican parents, and then we, my parents, went back to Jamaica in the 1970s. So all of us as kids went to Jamaica, and I lived in Jamaica for the next 15 years. So that's where I did my uh, finished my secondary education. Um, college, teacher training, and my first degree was all in Jamaica, University of the West Indies. And then I came back to England in 1988. So that would have been the, the year after, the year just before Levi went to Australia. Um, and I guess I've always been interested in history, history and politics, and particular po political history. So I actually um, to cut a long story short, I'm, I, I teach, I lecture in African and Caribbean political history, and um, I'm a senior lecturer at the University of, at the Birmingham City University in Black Studies. Um, so that's what I do now. Before that, I was teaching for seven years in Africa. I was a, a lecturer in African and International Studies at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. And um, before that, I worked as an education advisor for XL3. That's the organization that runs the National Black Boys Can Association. And um, I taught at a number of uh, colleges. And I, I mean, I taught at Fircroft College in the 1990s. That was African Caribbean studies. And um, uh, I taught at with the Open University for 10 years as well. I was an associate lecturer there. So my background is, is very much in um, kind of history and politics, international politics and development, particularly of Africa and the Caribbean. So um, my works, my papers, my, my books are all related to that area. So I think I sent, um, is it Simon? Is, is Simon the admin administrator? Of the yes, site, yes. Mm -hmm. so, right? So I think I sent Simon a, 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 just a blurb with with, with, with the, the various books I've written. So I know that um, Liz invited me on to talk about. I think it's the children's novel that I wrote. Um, is is that right, Liz? That is that the one that you? That is that is right because I was so impressed by this. It's quite a slim volume because it's a, a book for children. But you wrote it quite a long time ago, before we were really talking about uh, as much about embedding um, teaching black history in the curriculum. And so really, Tony, it's my ignorance that that, that was the <laughs> that was the thing that really connected me with you. And obviously, right. I was working with Steve Brooks and, and with the XL3 and the Black Boys Can and now the, the college, uh, the school in Birmingham. So so that was where our link was. So, um, uh, yes, but I'm, I'm just interested in particularly, you're welcome to tell us anything about your other experiences, because this is all about black history, these conversations, as we, right. we um, take the opportunity to, to find out about all sorts of different strands, both shared history and African history and Caribbean history. Um, but uh, we're also looking at, um, the stories of black people in the UK. And your book was one of the earliest um, th things that I knew about. And you were talking about the, um, the, the trumpeter in the, the court of King Henry, was it? Yeah, King Henry VII yeah. and the Eighth, yeah, yeah. yeah. John I Black. Apologize. Yeah. I, I haven't got a co your copy of the book here. It's safe in, safe in Wales. Um, but that's one of the themes that we want to follow through. So although, and, and we're also, I'm interested in children's books, because if we're to help children understand the black, black history, then we've got to um, acknowledge authors like yourself who, who've written books. And in Wales, we've got a colleague called Anne Carrad Thomas, and she's written a book about the Penryn Castle story with links with the plantations in Jamaica as a children's, as a fiction. But your book is a sort of a fiction. So tell us about it, will you? Right, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, as I should also mention, as Levi was speaking, um, everything that he was saying resonated with one of the, a little book that we did, which was a black oral history project. 
based in Warsaw. We actually interviewed 30 black people who had come to Warsaw in the 1950s and 60s. And we, we simply got them to tell us their stories. And we published that, um, in fact, over 10 years ago, but we did a reprint in nine, uh, two years ago. And that's oh, called, right. um, yeah, so that's, that's what I've sent to Simon. So, I mean, Simon yeah. can give you the details of that. As well. uh, but it resonates so much with what Levi was saying about his own father's experience, because everything that Le Le uh, Levi was saying, I could hear, I could hear the voices talking to me when we interviewed those people um, yeah. in uh, Warsaw. And that was almost 15 years ago. Yeah, when, when we first did that piece of research. So what, to come back, published, sorry, what was it published in? Was that? that book is, is called Through Sweat, Tears and oh. Triumphs. I can't even remember the full title okay. of it. Um, yeah. The Black yeah. Presence in Warsaw is okay. by myself. It's, it's um, Jenny yeah. Blake and Pat Housley and myself and Evadne, four of us. We Because the four yeah. of us did the research. We did yeah. the interviews. Yeah. And yeah. Um, we published that book um, just two, three years ago. Okay. Um, but I, I've sent Simon the details of it because what it does, that book, it's the people who are telling us their accounts. And it resonates so much with what your father was saying, um, the experience in the churches, yeah. um, the experience in their one rooms, um, yeah. the pushings or shovings as the Jamaicans yeah. call it, you know, all that rich experience. And it, we just let the people talk and we just wrote what they said. Yeah. And we've, all we've done is just do slight editings of it. But that's a little book that we did a couple of years ago. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. That sounds as if it's very useful. And I'll talk about books later, but yeah. Sure. Yeah. But for the children's one, um, what I wanted to do about 20 years ago, a few of us must, um, you might know Gilroy Brown. Yes. Um, yes. And Oscar Stroot, the late Oscar Stroot. Um, no, I didn't know or, Oscar. Oscar, we were all in, in, into education and we wanted to do a book for children, but it was to be a textbook. We never got around to it. And the three of us never really met again to even discuss that project. But because I'd been doing a lot of, um, I do a lot of sessions, training on black history and all sorts. Um, and one of the things that a number of parents had been asking for is a book for children especially about black British history. So, because almost as soon as you say black history, we see Martin Luther King, we see Rosa Parks, mm -hmm. we see Harriet Tubman and so on. So it's very American. Mm -hmm. And um, they, we're talking 10 years ago. So um, what I decided to do was to write a book suitable for children, but not a textbook, because I thought a textbook might be too heavy, it might not be attractive. So I simply selected seven different black people who'd been involved, who lived and worked in Britain. And then I simply fictionalized it. I just told the story of two children who they go back in time and they just have an encounter with these seven different individuals. So they travel all the way back, and then they meet Septimius Severus, who's the Roman emperor who ruled Britain in the second century AD. So, so I know, so, so, so they have an, an, an adventure with him. That story ends, then they meet the next character, they come back you know, to the present time, then they, then they go back in time and they meet John Blank. Now John Blank is the trumpeter, um, who played for King Henry the Seventh and King Henry the Eighth, um, and I mean, there's an intro. I, 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 that's, this is not in the book, but I, I mean, I was teaching this just a few months, just a couple of months ago, and I was saying, you know, there's an account where John Blank is negotiating with Henry the Eighth and saying, "Look, I would like to play as one of your trumpeters in your court in place of." Um, another person who I think had passed away, and your, your, your you know the, your predecessor, King Henry the Seventh, used to pay me this amount. So he's almost negotiating with King Henry the Eighth, not only about replacing the trumpeter who had died previously, but about his wages. Now, when you think of um, nego I mean, for you to be able to have that element of uh, discussion 
with any kind of um, political leader is in itself fascinating. But this is a black man um, having a discussion or having dialogue with King Henry VIII about um, negotiations about playing as part of the, 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 the trumpeteers at, um, the, the, uh, at um, Westminster. So, um, so, so this is this is a, it's it's really is a very powerful account. We don't know much about John Black. We just have little uh, sketches, of just a few brief jottings about this guy who played for Henry VIII, and he played at, and also for Henry the Seventh. And we know that his salary that he got as well, or his wages that he got for playing um, at that time. So that that's the second story. Um, then I they, the kids go back to their home. They come back to the present. Then they go back again, and then they encounter. Um, Mary Prince, who was a slave in Bermuda, who comes to Britain. She ends up writing a book, 1831, on, which is the first woman to write a book about the attacking and the, the, and the, um, the slavery in Britain. That's um, Mary Prince. So the kids, the two children in the story actually go back in time. They meet Mary Prince. They, they, they see her in London. And they get to see when she's escaping or whatever to go to meet up with Thomas Pringle of the Anti-Slavery Society, where she tells him his story and they, they more or less write her a biography, um, which is published. She also meets Mary Seacole, the, um, the nurse during the 1850s. Um, and she, again, the, the kids have a, have, have a um, dialogue with her on the battlefields. Not, of course, this is all totally fictitious. Can you imagine two kids, 10 and 11, um, on the outskirts of a battlefield, um, you know, with, with Mary Seacole, who's helping soldiers and so on. But this is that, so that part of the book, it's all fiction. But Mary Seacole actually lived, just like um, Mary Prince, who actually lived. And then I, I tell the story of um, William Davidson. In the book, I call him Jamaica's Black Guy Fawkes. So he tried to do what Guido Fawkes did in 1605, which is to, um, he's dissatisfied with the political establishment. This is Guy Fawkes. So of course, he's trying to get rid of them, but he's obviously not going to, um, through an electoral process. Now, here we have, uh, I'm putting that uh, kind of mild there, politely, but, um, here we have a black guy, William Davidson, in 1820 in London, who is part of a plot. So the plot is being planned by, um, his name just slips me now. Um, it will come back, I hope. Um, but there's about five or six people planning this, this plot. One of the guys is a black man called William Davidson. And he's part of the, the plot to overthrow the government of England in 1820. It's called the Cato Street Conspiracy. Um, or the, you know, so, so this is, a, a, I think one historian describes it as one of the most daring assassination attempts in British history. So what they'd planned to do was to go to Edgware Road, uh, Grosvenor Road, sorry, central London, where the cabinet was supposed to be having a dinner knock the door, knock out the doorman, this is all documented, and then storm the, the building, kill or shoot the other occupants of the house and declare the revolution started. And then they were going to go to the tower, of, to the back, to the, I think it was the, either the Bank of England or the Tower of London to declare that the, um, I think it was the Bank of England or somewhere to declare that the government had been toppled. Now, this is an extraordinary story, but what I, what I do here, I take the kids back to the room in Cato Street where this plot is being planned. And of course, one of them falls off a chair. I think the little boy falls off a chair and the kids get captured. And so all of that is, you know, it's someone said, well, that's total nonsense, but that's the story, that's, that's the fiction. But behind the fiction is a real story of, 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 of people plotting to kill, to take over the government in 1820. One of the, the ringleaders, but that they're eventually caught and, and they're hung, et cetera, including William Davidson, who was born in Jamaica, and he's a part of that um, campaign. So we might hear about Guy Fawkes, but I was just thinking that, how, do we ever hear about William Davidson of Jamaica, who was part of a, another plot to take over the government? So that's one story. And then I move forward, I come to um, Andrew Watson. Um, he's a 
um, is, is the world's first black football. I call him in my, on, on my other book, um, I've actually got the book here, but it's Andrew Watson, the world's first black football superstar, Andrew Watson. Um, most books on kind of black footballers in Britain talk about Arthur, uh, Arthur Wharton Tull. Oh. and Andrew Toll, Walter mm. Toll, but Walter Toll played in for Spurs and I'm a Spurs supporter for my sins. So it was Walter Toll that I was actually going to write about in the children's book. But when I realized that Andrew Watson had done so much more, I, I had to um, put my bias to one side and, and, and focus on Andrew Watson. So Walter Toll played for Spurs during World War I. Arthur Wharton was, a, was a, a, the, the Britain's first black professional footballer that we know of. And he played in the 1890s and early 20th century. He was a goalkeeper, played for Preston North End and a number of other teams. Um, but Andrew Watson, he played in the 1870s and the 1880s, just before football became a professional game. So he's not a professional footballer. Plus, his father was a slave owner. That's Andrew Watson's father, was a slave owner. And when he died, he left Andrew Watson and his sister the sum of £35,000, which is about £3 million plus in today's money. So... Andrew Watson was part of an elite. This guy was very well educated. And to cut a long story short, he was part of the, the group of, of, of Scottish players, because he played for Scotland, who helped to modernize the game of football as we know it today. So football as we know it today, the English game was really learned in Scotland. And Andrew Watson, played for, um, oh goodness me, why has the team gone for my face? Um, before, before Rangers and Celtic, Queen's Park. He, he, he actually played for Queen's Park and it was Queen's Park who pioneered this way of playing football, the passing game, rather than the English approach, which was similar to rugby where the, the big, bulky, powerful forward would, would dribble with the ball and, and that's kind of thing. Andrew Watson, born in Guyana, whose father was a slave owner, was part of this modernizing campaign. And he does something else which is remarkable. He captained the Scottish national football team in 1881. So here we have a black man who's so good that he captains the Scottish national football team. At this point, Scotland is the world's best team. Now, of course, there aren't many teams playing football, but Scotland was clearly miles ahead. They beat England 6-1 in 1881, and that is still England's heaviest ever defeat in a football match. The captain of the Scottish team, black guy, Andrew Watson. Um, so the kids go back and they meet, have an encounter with him, and then they come forward to the final story, which is um, Claudia Jones. Claudia Jones is, um, She's born in Trinidad and Tobago. She goes to America. She's a communist, a proper diehard communist, not even a socialist. And um, you'll see why I'm saying that in a minute. And um, she's a woman's rights activist. She's a black activist and a Marxist, all rolled into one, this Claudia Jones. She, she's expelled from America because of her, her radical views. She comes to England and she sets up a carnival in the, and that carnival was held indoors in the town hall i think it's westminster i could be wrong there i'll have to check my notes again but it's claudia jones who introduced the idea of the not the notting hill carnivals that we now celebrate in the uk oh. they came out of claudia jones inspiration and what she wanted to do was to simply because of the riots taking place in england Again, it goes back to what Levi was saying, you know, black and white people fighting, race riots. Claudia Jones said, I'm gonna hold an event to showcase what Caribbean people and culture is like or are alike. So she held at that first meeting inside a building. It wasn't an outdoor event at all. And there was music, there was food, etc. So people would sit down and, and then there would be people on a stage performing. That was the first carnival. When, uh, by the 1960s, after Claudia Jones's death, 
then we get the outdoor thing because carnival in the Caribbean is an outdoor thing, just like in Brazil. It's, it's all outdoors. Um, it's a street parade, but then the weather, the climate allows that. But here in England, the very first one was done indoors. So basically this story, that book is designed to introduce children to black history, but from a British perspective, and in a way that is not too, um, because it's children, you could almost meet the individuals and not even realize that they're black. I mean, in the book, for example, when, um, when the kids see the Roman soldiers marching through the streets of York, then they see this, they're describing the soldiers. I think I've got a few sentences there. And I think when, when the boy, Omar, who's 10, the 10 year old boy in the story, he says, but look, but that guy looks like a black guy. And, and so, so the, and I kind of make that mention in the book because the children themselves don't know what they're, they're astonished as anyone else to see what they're seeing. So it's like the children are learning history through the eyes of these two children. So that's the aim of the book. Um, it's very simply read, sorry, very simply written because I'm aiming it at um, sort of eight, nine-year-olds and early teens. But a number of adults have read it and have found it quite interesting because um, it's kind of simple, it's direct. And um, I'm, 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 I keep saying I must really get onto book two, but um, time just keeps running away from me. But um, that's the essence of, of that book. I, don't, I, I hope you got the gist of it. I'm, I'm trying to give you an overview of what the book was like, but that's the essence of the book. Um, well, that, that's just fantastic. And I'm sure that everybody who's just listened to you um, summarizing the characters in the book, the two children, and then, then the, the characters, the, the real characters, the children are fictitious, but the, the characters are real. Uh, can understand why I was so impressed. So I probably read this. It would have been about ten years ago. You reckon, Tony? You wrote it? Yeah, that. Uh, yeah, it's twenty twelve. That's right. Yeah, but I yeah, promised yeah. that one. Yeah. So it's a good long time ago, and I was just riveted because I didn't know hardly any of those stories. I'd heard of Mary Seacole, but I hadn't. I honestly hadn't heard of any of the other stories. And so it really made me think, you know, well, if I don't know this and I can learn all this from in such an entertaining way. And one of the things we've been talking about is about historical fiction and historical fact and the way we're writing books, because there is a big need to to have more um, books that that we can um, for children and for adults. But I mean, I could I could remember now. It's one of those books that you just sat down and read the whole book. It was was so interesting, and I didn't know that there'd been a Roman emperor who um, was in York, and he actually died and was buried in in York. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Septim, and yeah. he and he yeah. was he was an African. He was um, yeah. he was I born. I had no idea. Yeah, born in Libya, so, as we now know it. Yeah, yeah. North yeah. Africa. Yeah. So fantastic. So since then, we've I've taken um, a, a real interest um, in exploring stories of uh, um, African people, uh, Caribbean people who've who've lived in um, England, Wales, and maybe Scotland. But I'm sure there are others who want to, to say things because we have. Um, Jim Zakordin, who is Guyanese background, and I don't know if he knows anything about Andrew Watson and the, his slave owning father and the story there. And also um, uh, David Alston, his, his research in the Highlands and, and uh, slavery is about I, I think, um, yeah. the link with Suriname um, and uh, Guyana. <laughs> I, yes. I've just realised, as during our discussion, that Tony and that I were in touch. Yeah, I think we've, about, we've, we've, yes, <laughs> <laughs> about about ten years ago, I think. Yeah, about, because about I, our, I think yeah. yes, I, I, you know, I when I saw the name, I'm thinking, but I should know this. This name sounds familiar. <laughs> So then I went and when I saw you, obviously we've not met no. visibly. So yeah. I thought, well, maybe it must be another David Alston. But I'm sure I I know of a David yeah. Alston because mm -hmm. I can I we when I was writing the book on Andrew Watson. You sent me a couple of files on on um, yeah, Scottish. I, uh, well, 
yeah, my particular interest is, interest is in Guyana, with a, and I yeah. have a particular okay. interest in, in the children of Highland Scots right. um, okay. and okay. enslaved women or free women of colour in, in, in Guyana. Um, Andrew Watson's, um, and, I've, and since we were in touch, I mean, I, I've, I've done a, a lot of investigating of that, of their, that family. Yeah. Um, Andrew Watson's grandmother came from about 10 miles away from where I am in Cromarty in the north of Scotland. Um, and his his father was was born in Orkney, and yeah. uh, they are. I mean, as you were saying, they're not just they're slave owners, but they're they're also the the super rich of the of the slave owners by by the time of emancipation. The the company that they're part of has become um, Sandbach Tine by that point, and they they receive enormous amounts of of compensation at emancipation. But interestingly, I've also got interested in the last year in William Davidson. I didn't realise that you'd you'd written about him. Um, And I think I've managed to trace his roots back to um, a family in Aberdeenshire. So, um, so, yeah, so so it's really been fascinating. And I I must get hold of your your children's book. I, I I, I didn't know about it. Great to meet right, you. Okay. Yes, well, fine. Yes, it's nice to meet you as well. <laughs> right. oh, that's great. So, Jim, I don't know, if, was this news to you? Had you heard of Andrew I, Watson before? No, I, uh, I never heard of Watson. Oh, very interesting. Uh, Tony's work, I'd like to see, like uh, David, I'd like to see a copy of that book. Uh, but the thing is, uh, I wrote my first book in 1984 when I was a National Trade Union officer. And all that was my swan song. It was to do with racism within trade unions. And it could have been equally sexism within trade unions because all the leaders were men and they were white aging men. And that was a network. In fact, the unions operated against black people and against women getting equal pay and equal uh, opportunities. And so I was part of that struggle. And then I found my way out after a major trade union leader at the time said to me, Jim, you've got no future in this trade union movement as long as you have a hole in your backside. And so I said, David, there's your key. I'm gonna empty my cupboard and I'm going home to find another job. And of course, trade unionists, trade unions paid their employees very well. The male employees do negotiating work extremely well, but the women in the back room, typists and admin, were getting a fraction of what the officers were getting. And and so that's interesting. But the point I wanted to make is uh, that as black people, few of us read books. Uh, We read the books we've written ourselves. And for me, as an author of over a dozen books, I have difficulty passing my books on or selling my books to fellow black people who are interested in history but wouldn't buy a book. Uh, you go to their homes and there may be the Bible, there will be the Bible and a few other books, but not books in politics because like the guy talked earlier about his dad, didn't want to explain much of his background and experience in Britain because it was too political. We came, we were fighting racism and, but a lot of people didn't want to talk about it, about their history or their experience. And there's plenty has been written. In those days, we didn't have camera. You may have a little brownie camera taking black and white pictures, but we never had the mobile phone and, and taking pictures and, and organizing that way. We print our leaflets in a Ronio, Ronio printer, we type it and then on the rolling machine print it out. <laughs> Very poor quality. You can hardly hardly read it. Um, but my daughter, who lives in Birmingham and works for the university, and so when I ask her to check our friend out, I forgot. <laughs> you do that. I forgot Dr. his Tony name now because he's, he's gone off the screen. What oh, no, no, t- Tony's moved, but he's still no, on I'm, the screen. He's back. I'm he's still back. here. Yeah, I'm still Tony, here. I'm yeah. going to ask my daughter to check you out. All right. Uh, she works um, at the university, and yeah. she's the she's the head uh, managing a group that deal with students and staff mental health issues. Her name yeah. is Jane Jane Fickordin. and okay, right. no, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. she's that's done some good. writing, but we. I'll ask her to catch up with you. But we need 
that book. I've written a book and I talked about it last time. I didn't get a single orders from this network or from any other network. So during the whole month of November, December, when I sell my, my books normally, I sold none at all. I gave six, seven away as Christmas presents. But we're going to start, right. we're going to start so, reading each other's book and persuade black people to read their history. It's a big right. job. But I find most the people, 90%, 95% people who bought my book are white, white folks who are already committed to anti-racism. And it's the people that don't show an interest, get involved, has a lot to say about it uh, that we need to persuade. That, that storming of the, of the um, American uh, Congress Senate the other day, there were black people amongst those people amounts that crowd, there were black people amongst them. And these were white racist fascists, terrorists storming the, the American democracy. And there was black people joining them. But there was good black people in Georgia, the black woman who registered 1.8 black people to vote. So we have a struggle amongst ourselves, Tony, to look at how we portray racism and black history. And I'm very pleased the way you have done it in the way you have done it in the story for young people that's excellent and and tell you i'd like to work with you i'd like to support your work i'd like to read your work first and then i'll find ways in which i can publicize your book get people to buy it it seems a very good book liz is the only one who read it uh, but that's the kind of literature using different ways using literature, using politics, using trade unions, using uh, other sources to get our books across. But sadly, we've got a big job to educate fellow black people that life is more than making money or joining the middle class. But as working class people, we have a tremendous history that we can feel proud of. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Jim. That, that's so valuable. and. Um, and Jim, one of the things that, that I want to discuss, and I've been discussing with uh, Professor Sati and others is, um, and especially with Leslie Evans, um, is that we started a black history book club, but we decided reading one book a month was going to take us far too long to get anywhere. And we didn't really get it off the ground before Christmas. And now we're thinking of doing other things to bring authors together and we've got several of you I can see on the screen who are, who are authors, or at least will have written articles. Um, and it's about where people find information about black history. And the, the, yes, you can, you can search at random on, on Google, but um, if, if we can guide people to books that you can read on particular themes about black history because it's such a huge subject and Tony I think as you said black history originally black history month was an American idea so it tends to, there's been a tendency for it to go go to those those black history stories and yet we're finding there are so many more and and your your um description of the book was just absolutely brilliant and and thank you so much for that um, i make another point just a brief yeah. point i'll okay. be very brief i i think uh, lots of people can approach black history if they read other history as well uh, for example yeah. as an equality consultant for many years i never gone straight in and talk about black struggle and racism I talk, if there's a lot of women in the audience, I will talk about sexism. Young people in the audience, I'll talk about uh, discrimination against young people or older people or LGBTQ people. Because once you come out with race, it seems you're hitting people straight in the face. And so I encourage people to read all history, not only black history, but the suffering of the Irish people, the Scots people, the English people, the Welsh people. And once we can build this affinity, with other people who know that not only were black people slaves, but English people were slaves and slavery was, was um, popular and quite acceptable in this country until 1828. In, in the 12th, 13th century, you had slave markets in Britain and English people bought and sold. Scottish 
uh, Irish people were sold as indentured laborers under the pretense to America, but they were, they were really slaves. But they were, they were called indentured laborers or, or going to America and other parts of the world to do housework. Irish children sent to Australia and, and exploited. So this late thing, although we're talking about black history, we've got to share other people's history that will come and join us in the struggle and be part of that struggle. Final point is the book I wrote about Enrico. I have it on a link. I'm no good with IT, but I, a friend did it on a link. I'm happy to share that book to other people on a link, as indeed shared a book about my own life story. I think I've shared that. But nobody's going to say, Jim, your book is interesting. Uh, from what I've seen from the link. I've got a link of a, one of the most important books I've read in my whole life on race. And that's book I helped Enrico Stennett to write. It's called Bakra Masa Pickney, a Jamaican of mixed race with Scottish um, parents or grandparent background. He came with the Windrush as a 17 year old, the same age when I arrived, well, I arrived at 16 in Britain. Uh, and so uh, there's tons there, but I've offered it, but nobody said, can I read it? So in a sense, I've always been trying to be honest. A lot of white people here, a lot of people interested in black history. Oh, geez, yeah, my wife just told me lunch is ready. Thank you. Darling. All right, then. Well, I'm going to say to you, Jim, you've really inspired me. And this idea that we've got of, of having a, a, a central point. And we, we had a meeting um, last Saturday and, and we were discussing, yeah. discussing it then. So um, I think it will be something that we will really follow up. And Jim, please send me the links again, please. And okay. Tony, would you mind sending me the, the link for the, your books as well, please? Um, yeah, I've uh, already... Simon yeah, says he's, he's managed to, he can't manage to find it. Um, and oh, the email. Side, yeah. Can, can you can he, can you send it to me and then... All right, I'll send it says, after. He says yeah. he's got some problems. Yes, it's not, not a hurry. Okay, so that's really good. Now, um, we've... Yeah. Um, Liz, I've just think... checked. The book is available, uh, Tony's book is available on Amazon. I yes, can post yes. the link. <laughs> I yeah, found it there. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and unfortunately, Levi has gone now, but I was just going to mention that, uh, Helen, you've put a message here. Um, uh, interesting, because you're a writer and illustrator of Ethiopian children's literature. And Levi had actually worked in uh, Ethiopia for a while, but we'll follow that one up again. Um, OK, then. So um, uh, various people want to ask questions. Cut Chris or make points, Chris? Hi, Tony. Um, very interesting and um, well illustrated um, <coughs> book by the sounds of it. Um, these asked a couple of questions of people if they knew about this or if they knew about that. I knew, I knew about the um, emperor and um, the trumpeter and Mary Seacole, who we last year tried to um, do Mary Seacole Day um, and everything like that. But my point being is the history, what you add at that time, what you put out at that time for publication, it's like gold dust in this time because it's so relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Politically, it was a different time then. Um, yeah. Now, um, black history, um, is more relevant than ever. The sort of history where you was talking about um, and the reasons why. I think a lot of it um, is to do with the Renaissance and the covering up of history and events and of service and of um, deeds. And so actually, um, when you talk about the kings of England and you found it strange that that conversation should be had with King Edward or whoever. Um, Henry. Henry, Edward, Henry, sorry. Um, well, the kings of Europe at that time as well, just from the 700s going up, right? Yeah, they did rule Europe and a lot of um, things of have been whitewashed through the Renaissance. For your stories, I think we recapture them. 
right back from Roman times, you know, and um, the way uh, you went back in time with your characters, it's, it's, it, it's been done before, but it's just beautifully done by yourself. And um, I would like to um, get that book as well and, and use that book within the new curriculum, what we're having in Wales, because it seems like it's a very comprehensive, easy way to describe um, events within Black history where we contributed to. My only last point is that um, Dr. Um, G Dr. Jim, um, he made reference about um, people not taking up book offers and things like that um, and not supporting our own. But the time has changed. I think there's a lot of support for black history. Furthermore to that, shared world history, because it's all about history. Um, make reference about Ireland and their struggles. Well, I can go 10,000 years before and talk about the Twa people of Ireland, who were Pygmies, and who, 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 who actually were the first um, settlers in Ireland, the Twa people, you can look it up yourself, and they were black, you know, the first pygmies, and they, they called them um, um, leprechauns at that time, doing magic, working with Neko, you know? Um, so we, there's a lot of history, and maybe you can say about shared world history, and if people's gonna accept it, um, the mechanism now, for the younger generation at least, is this media. And I think um, a lot of what you say about whatever book anybody's describing, you show such a visual effect that um, because we've got Zoom, because we've got um, whatever other social medias, I think a lot of the, a lot of the books should be um, more put onto our platforms where where in a discussion where you, you're discussing it and you're illustrating it verbally. But I'm not gonna go on about that anyway, but it was brilliant, brilliant. And um, Tony, you described some of the other subjects where your expertise lies as well, more than children's books. I would have liked to have heard of something more what, you was, what else you do, but maybe a next time, but thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. And, and um, Tony, I think that's probably a really good idea. I don't think it's it's right to ask you now to tell tell us about uh, the many other things that you've done. Um, but it would be really great if you're willing to, to join us perhaps on another occasion. Um, would that be possible? Yeah, possibly. Um, uh, today's not, what, not, Friday? Yeah. Not, not, I, I mean, not, not in the immediate future, but perhaps in a few weeks time. Um, would that be okay? Yeah, that might be okay. I mean, um, yeah. I was, as, as Chris was talking, I was just thinking that um, he's made a valid point that um, in terms of books, um, sometimes, especially the age we now live in with young people, they might be more into books that talk to them, speaking books and things online rather than mm -hmm. Doing, I, I still love, I mean, up to last week I bought a book and you know, I'm still buying books because um, I, I'm, I'm of that age where I, I prefer to turn the page like this rather than to look on the screen. But I have mm. got, if you go on YouTube, I give a talk. There's a, just, I think about, it's, it's not actually my, it's a TV show where I'm talking about two or three of the books and one, and, and the children's book is mentioned um, there. And I also give, on YouTube, I've, I've done a presentation on Andrew Watson as well. Where I, where I go in a bit more detail. It's about 12 minutes where I talk about um, why I think this guy, I think he's far more significant than Walter Toll and Andrew Watson and Arthur Wharton combined. This guy is mega, but it's just that he's, um, we don't know much about him, which is so sad. This year, March would be 100 years since he died, buried in, in oh, London. Wow. Yeah, but, um, um, he did well, so we, much. Perhaps we can make something special of that because you've written, haven't you, about, uh, you've written a book about Andrew yeah, Watson. I've got, uh, yeah, I've got a specific book on yeah. Andrew Watson. But what I'm saying, so, and we are, there is a group of us actually planning, we were planning to redo his grave 
Um, oh, right, good. And do a headstone and so on, because he, he's just completely forgotten. But he did so much for football. Uh, and I, my book was only about football. So um, um, he, he was absolutely, you know, he was absolutely mega um, at this point. So... Um, Fabulous. Yeah, well, can you yeah. can you let, let us have the link with your YouTube talk because that would be very very helpful, um, and then maybe when it's the hundredth anniversary in March, then maybe you can talk to us again um, and tell us what you're doing in recognition of the anniversary, and um, that would be that would be really good. If that's okay. Anyway, we'll see. We'll talk about that. So, Tony, thank you so much. That's been absolutely brilliant, um, and and inspirational in a number of ways and and particularly as an author um that's one of the things that that we're really interested to see what we can bring out of this um now there's an author from uh, north wales called miranda kaufman and she's written a book on the black tudors i don't that's know right. if you know yeah, that yeah. one yeah yeah yeah, yeah, um, yeah. it's on so our reading she, list yeah yeah she's on she's on our our list to to get in and speak as well. And uh, Simon, I was wondering um, next week, I'd suggested in our um, planning that that um, you and the team from Belong might like to talk about the story of George Africanus, the research you did there. Yeah, I think we can we can do that. Um, tie in nicely with uh, me rebuilding, relocating the George Africanus website back onto the Belongs pe Belong pages. So. Right. Okay. Yep. Well, that would be really good because that's an interesting story. George Africanus um, was one of those um, uh, young black people who were brought over by uh, maybe uh, ship's captains or whatever. And he was, um, I'm not sure, but we'll hear about it next week. But he ended up with the Molyneux family in Wolverhampton. So there's a story in Wolverhampton about this. Um, and there's a story in um, uh, Nottingham where he then went as an adult to live. So next week, a, I'm going to... A, bit a businessman and an unusual, yeah. unusually yeah. for his time, somebody yeah. who could vote. <laughs> yes, yes. So that, that'll be fascinating. So what we're going to try and do, though, is to follow through all these, these different um, threads and, and see how we can move forward. But the, the thing about the books and... Um, it's great on the um, uh, uh, comments page, um, uh, Simon, you're saying maybe we can build an online list and repository. Well, yes, that's sort of the idea that we've got um, and to um, engage different authors and, and encourage others to, to write more. So um, also Jim's saying that um, Professor Sati that he's waiting for to know how we can send some books to you because that's one of the pledges that we made um so professor sati perhaps we can discuss that on email or or suggestions yes. now but yeah. over to you professor sati for, for two or three minutes to tell us whatever you want to tell us today <laughs> yeah i have nothing very really new to say but to thank um Tony for his uh, wonderful presentation that looks like uh, the archaeology of history for trying to dig out those who did wonderful things in the past and bringing them to the fore. Uh, singing the unsung heroes and heroines is part of historical uh, knowledge and it is deeply appreciated. I just have one little concern that is personal to me about um, Black History Month, for example, or Black History. Conceptually, um, when you talk of black history back in Africa, it, it's not like some kind of racialization. Uh, but in Africa, we would talk about African history. Uh, but, uh, but because you are in jurisdictions that, um, or you are in areas where uh, those, those, those um, terminologies matter, they, they sell, but they will hardly fly here in Africa, South of Sahara, when you say you want to do black history, people will hardly understand what you're talking about. But when you yeah. say you want to do African history, yeah, it, it, yeah. It's, it's understood. So uh, that's just what I wanted to uh, clarify. But I think I understand the conversations, um, but then um, for it to be extended Africa-wide, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, I, for example, cannot convene 
a group and I say we want to talk about black history, they wouldn't understand it. Yeah. I, th I think I that's a really good, I think it's a really good point that you're making. Um, and I think there's different ways of talking because to talk about our shared history is also another way and work that we're doing learning links international is about shared history with Jamaica and shared history between North Wales and stories there and stories in um, North Clarendon and um, we've discovered some really interesting stuff about um, the post-emancipation time and the union work. You'll be interested in this, Jim, if you haven't gone off to lunch. Um, the union um, links. And um, we've been able to find quite a lot of information about, about uh, union activists in the Caribbean um, and the, the work that they were able to do to um, improve conditions for, for workers there. So the shared histories, there's black history when you're talking about um, like the American um, situation but each mm. you know each country needs to look at at the his, historical links in their own way really um, but yes we need to take that up so thanks very much for that uh, Professor Satie. Um, now the only other person who I was hoping was going to just uh, tell us a little little bit if you can just have five minutes are you still there Lisa? Lisa? Yes yes oh, I am still, still here. here. Um, <laughs> All right I've no oh idea goodness. what time it is what time it is it is it in Texas? Um, it is 7 30 in the morning so well, I'm actually in well to get up so early. I'm in my grandbaby room, so it looks very uh, baby oriented. This was the quietest place in the house. So um, right. the, the grandchildren mind. come to. Well, I am so privileged just to listen in. I am um, absolutely in awe of the work and the passion that everyone has. So as Liz mentioned, my interest is that I'm researching the role of wool um, as a commodity that sustained empire building. And so I am looking at, um, at micro histories and the way that it, uh, these threads, if you will, pardon the pun, connect different places around the world. And so I'm, I'm looking through the lens of wool to see how um, so many different places are linked together through this commodity. And so, uh, I'm looking at Welsh wool and the Welsh plains specifically and how um, that takes us to Jamaica and you have uh, the connection to people who are producing in Wales with those who are wearing the wool um, in other places and this commodity becomes important in um, all of the um, American colonies. And so um, this thread takes us to um, the American, North American colonies. And through that, the control of wool with uh, the Wool Act and how important wool is um, as people um, use wool so importantly as we develop and establish independence in America, um, how it is used as a commodity for enslaved persons in so many different places as well. And at the same time provides agency and opportunity for independence. So it's controlled and yet it is uh, a tool for independence and how the wool also is used um, in establishing Australia and then becomes um, a commodity that provides opportunity for those who established themselves in Australia eventually. So I'm, I'm definitely just hitting the highlights, um, but this commodity and its presence throughout empire and how it was such an important commodity throughout history, um, but was this surviving, very um, foundational force um, that it was kind of underrepresented historiographically because it wasn't a moneymaker always. So 
it does my my lens takes us to the individuals who through their quiet um devotion to survival is uh, held together through through wool so it's an interesting commodity to be able to pull together the histories of so many people who are not going to make it into a history book because they were not um the movers and shakers if you will but those who just sustained themselves and and survived regardless of their situation so it does look at individuals um in a way that they've been underrepresented through this underrepresented commodity and which blends in so incredibly with black history because it's everyone's history and it's everywhere and it it's more than just black history it's the history of individuals and i think this is such a great time historiographically as a historian we're not in a time where we're just looking for the big moments but we're looking for the individuals who are those people who were the spinners and the shipbuilders or the enslaved persons or the um the women who were sent to um colonize uh, who would have otherwise been um destined for the gallows um so i'm I'm interested in the individuals and the people and the agency that they're able to glean through wool. So that's what brings me to the table. I've been, it's very interesting to be in America and listen to the perspective from outside of America. And as one person mentioned, there are so many um, black figures who are used as a standard lens to look at black history. And yet, even though there are so many American names of recognition, we have so far to go in America to do justice to the individual black history. And I marveled at the advancement and the honesty that was taking place when I uh, attended a conference and met Liz in Wales. I thought, I wish we could have this kind of transparency in America to say, this is our history. And it's, there are parts of it that are ugly and there are parts of it that need to be recognized. And I felt like there was such an honesty that was taking place outside of America that I wish I could bring back here and, and um, carry that forward. So hopefully together we can all create a voice for those who are um, not heard as of yet. Um, it, it's a very interesting time. Uh, someone else mentioned something that um, it would be so wonderful if there were more people um, that were reading, more Black people who could make a difference that were reading the Black history. And that's something that kind of resonated when I was looking into New Zealand's Maori. And there's an effort right now to have Maori write more of their own history as opposed to having historians who are not Maori document that history. And so I don't know how you foster that interest and enthusiasm, but I think certainly honest discussions and riveting information and definitely that children's book i'll be on amazon to get that as well because uh what a great place to start with a with ripe open minds who are ready to be fed and kind of change the course of history because what we do read is the the bigger picture and you know let's just take one example if you're talking about an explorer you've heard their names but who are the shipbuilders who are the people that mm. that grew the food to feed the people um, aboard that ship? There's a great book um, by Judith Carney called Black Rice. And I really love that book because um, it gives agency to the understanding that 
in America, we've talked about the establishment of colonies and how important the commodity of rice was, but we never fully acknowledged that that wasn't possible without the brilliance of people who did not have the choice to be transported, but brought with them a knowledge that was unequivocal to anything that was in the Americas when certainly didn't come from Europeans. That knowledge of, of rice cultivation only came through those who were transported. So that kind of agency is new and exciting to shine a light on. And so it's an exciting time to be a researcher or historian. And we have the privilege now of kind of cracking open and pulling back the curtains on untold histories and I'm excited about it. Well, thank you so much. That that was just really, really interesting. I mean, your your work's just fantastic. And uh, um, we, we need to invite you on a, a Saturday. We do one Saturday a month where we look at um, continuing our breath in project and perhaps you'll come and talk to us there. But also we're trying to plan ahead. Uh, season one, the first 12 sessions, October to December, we sort of um, uh, went from week to week, but we're now trying to plan ahead um, because we've, we've got interesting themes and we're going to do um, a session hopefully towards the end of February. Um, and we're looking at textiles and Simon's got lots of links with cotton um, and it would be great, Lisa, if you could come and speak with us again then. It would be really good. So uh, we'll, we'll see how we, we, we work through, through this programme. So, Simon, if you want to, to stop the recording now and then we can just catch up on a couple of other things before everybody goes. Thanks ever so much, everybody. Thank you very much indeed, Tony, for your presentation. That was just, just brilliant. Thank you so much.